This is Ecommerce FM, the e-commerce SEO podcast with Rob Carey and Matt Young. So welcome along then to the first ever e-commerce FM. This is the e-commerce SEO show. My name is Matt Young, one of your hosts, and may I also introduce to you uh, the wonderful Rob Carey. Hello, Rob. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, very well, my friend. What I thought we'd do first of all, Rob, is to introduce ourselves and uh, let the listener know exactly who we are and what we're all about. So uh, I think you, being the uh, the man in the know, uh, should go first. Okay, so yep, as I said, my name is Rob Kerry, and I'm a SEO that specialises in e-commerce businesses, and currently work with a number of small UK e-commerce brands such as um, Sea Salt and Paper Chase. I've worked before on some of the big US brands such as Macy's, and over here in the UK with O2 as well. And currently, just working on a software as a service that's going to help make e-commerce SEO a lot easier. Fantastic. Sounds like you've got some really good qualifications there. And I love the fact you say a couple of small UK uh, people like Paper Chase. Uh, I mean, you're doing yourself a bit of a disservice there, aren't you, really? (laughs) Yeah, they're a good brand to work with. And there's a lot of exciting things going ahead. So uh, this talk is probably actually quite appropriate for them as uh, they're working on a JavaScript driven e-commerce site at the moment. Fantastic. So we'll get on to what the show is about in just one second. So my name is Matt Young. Uh, I'm a digital marketeer based here in the Southwest. Um, the reason Rob and I have got together to record this, uh, I think he he is the expert, as you'll find out as we go along. And uh, I'm the uh, I'm going to call myself the mouthpiece um, <laughs> because uh, I have a broadcasting background, done a few podcasts, been a radio presenter, but have been uh, working in digital marketing for about ten years now. So uh, between us, uh, we think we've got the uh, the right ingredients to put together uh, this show about e-commerce SEO. So, Rob, uh, today's topic then, you wanted to talk about uh, Ajax, which is a JavaScript-driven e-commerce website. First of all, uh, could you just tell us what it's all about, please? Yeah, I mean, Ajax is quite an old term. I mean, it's been around since 1999. Uh, I think it's a bit of a backronym, really, because obviously Ajax being a Greek mythological hero, I think they were just trying to make it sound cool. But yeah, it means asynchronous JavaScript and XML, but it basically covers any situation, really, where the content is updated after the HTML page has actually load loaded um, with a data from an endpoint a different url uh, if you be so it's uh, mostly used where data changes a lot on a web page and needs to be updated and i think the the biggest first case where people really started to notice it being used was actually gmail by google uh, which launched in 2004 um, that's a very widely known example where when you click on things they update automatically without the url changing and you can drag and drop emails and the server knows what you're doing and can update its records accordingly so it's kind of like for the the dynamic side of the website or the web page yeah exactly yeah okay so uh, obviously we're, we're touching here about javascript as well so why are javascript frameworks suddenly become quite trendy I think mobile apps are really the big driving force behind it. Customers uh, want to experience websites a lot like how they experience the apps of those uh, brands that they uh, use a lot. And I think users get frustrated with clicking on something and waiting for a whole new page to load. And JavaScript frameworks are kind of designed to fix that issue by only loading certain bits of content within the page, which the user is interested in. So it's kind of a way of standardizing dynamic websites. So a JavaScript framework means that everyone uses the same code base to build their dynamic websites. It saves a lot of time. It makes it easier when new people get involved in a website, the fact that they know the JavaScript framework already. Um, And it allows for new technology to be built as well on top of it, such as creating mobile apps, even using the JavaScript frameworks. It's also led by a trend called single page apps or SPAs, which uh, load the JavaScript framework and HTML scaffolding at the very beginning and then change the content of that page uh, without really updating the URLs too much. It gives kind of a mobile app feel. Excellent. Okay. And is there a, uh, a framework which is most popular? Is there one that uh, is most commonly used? 
Yeah, well, I think the two big frameworks are React and Angular, and they're kind of fighting against each other in a way because React is maintained by Facebook and Angular is maintained by Google, two big powerhouses of the internet. Hmm. Now, there are some smaller frameworks as well, things like Ember and Vue. Uh, Vue is actually quite popular within the PHP community, so you tend to see it more on Magento websites and e-commerce websites that use a PHP-based uh, e-commerce store it's interesting isn't it that you've got the likes of facebook and google very much involved in this i think the big question then for you really is are these frameworks seo friendly well none of them are really 100 percent seo friendly unfortunately search engines save time and money by basically requesting just the html of a website uh, that's where the content usually is and by creating these JavaScript-driven websites, you're often removing the content from the initial HTML that loads when someone loads a page, and you load that content in dynamically afterwards. Now, Google's adapted to support these kind of websites by loading websites using Google Chrome. So they basically try and load a web page just like someone would in a browser. But this doesn't happen straight away. Uh, Google actually takes the static version of uh, the web page first and then renders it later on uh, if it's got time to do so. It prioritizes the bigger and the faster websites when doing this. So there's no guarantees that Google will see your dynamic content underneath. And Google also has quite low timeout settings. So if your JavaScript is quite low, is quite slow, the content takes a lot of time to get loaded onto the browser, then Google might not see it at all. And of course, Google only has a huge market share in a few countries, mostly the English speaking countries. There's lots of other countries where Google isn't king. And most other search engines really haven't perfected the whole technique of loading web pages like they're in a browser. So if you have a look at websites which are dynamic in a search engine such as Bing or Yandex or Beidou or DuckDuckGo, then you'll see a very different set of content compared to what Google sees just because they're not able to handle those dynamic websites as well. It's interesting, isn't it? If you've got an international audience, it's really important that you know these sort of things. Um, so what can I do then as a website owner to make JavaScript-driven websites more SEO-friendly? Uh, I think there's three big things to do. The first is to make sure that all of your metadata for SEO and all the text-based content is loaded in the HTML uh, when someone first requests a web page and isn't loaded in dynamically using the JavaScript. This means that all search engines are able to see the important information that you need to rank for SEO. Uh, the second thing is to make sure that the content that is dynamic gets loaded very quickly, ideally using something like a CDN, which is a content distribution network. We'll just make sure that no matter where someone is in the world, that information gets loaded very quickly and served to them very quickly to make sure that the search engines don't time out before they can actually load that content. The third, and probably most importantly, is to use a, a pre-rendering or dynamic rendering technology uh, to make sure the search engines can read your website. Okay, so the, uh, the million-dollar question is, what is pre-rendering and uh, dynamic pre-rendering, please, Rob? Well, it's a software, or you can have it as a software as a service that renders your pages for the search engines using a, a virtual web browser. So when a search engine visits your page, they actually see a static web page rather than a dynamic page. Um, there's services out there such as prerender.io and SEO for Ajax, which are a software as a service solution. You basically allow them to handle the whole, whole process of rendering the page uh, for you and serving that to the search engines. And Google's actually offering their own free solution as well, which you can install on your own servers, something called Puppeteer and Rendertron, uh, are two services there which you can uh, install yourself so you don't have to use any third-party service and basically detects if a search engine is visiting the page and if it is, then it serves the, the static HTML rendered version of that page. So it basically, it caches the HTML that, happens when all the javascript has loaded 
and uh, turns a single page app into a static website. So it saves the search engines a lot of work in having to render that content themselves. And it can also cope with slow loading JavaScript that you might have. So if you do have content which takes a while to load, then your pre-rendering service can load that slowly and then load the fast copy to the uh, search engines. So uh, there are some cases where pre-rendering services render the page live, which can result in very slow pages because you have to wait for the pre-rendering service to load the slow page. And then after it's loaded, immediately give it to the search engines. Um, And you also have situations where a website visit triggers the uh, rendering of the page as well, which can also result in a very slow experience. So you basically need to cache pages wherever possible um, to make sure that website crawlers or visitors don't have to load that uh, information all themselves and wait for it all to be loaded. There's so much to remember, isn't there? It really is. So yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, what's the point in making a website dynamic then? You know, if search engines see a static version of the website, why, why do we need to make it dynamic? That's a good question. Um, I'd say that JavaScript frameworks and single-page apps are developing faster than search engines can cope with, really. It's probably the future, but you want the traffic and the SEO revenue now. You don't want it later on once search engines have created a solution which allows them to index this content a lot easier. I mean, I tell my e-commerce clients to avoid using JavaScript-heavy frameworks wherever possible, although it's not always possible because sometimes the decisions made higher up and before the marketing team gets involved. So sometimes you just have to go ahead with it. Um, So I'd say save the fancy JavaScript and um, the apps that hide the content, you know, sort of for things which are behind a login screen. You know, these frameworks were developed for creating data visualization dashboards and control panels. They're not really designed for loading your product listing pages and product detail pages. Uh, Websites are transitioning uh, to JavaScript front ends, uh, usually the ones that do usually see a traffic drop uh, from SEO uh, unless their previous website was a lot, lot worse uh, SEO wise. And websites using JavaScript frameworks tend to be slow on the first visit, uh, can cause URL issues, especially if the URL format is changing. And also if the uh, the URL or the service which is serving the content in the background dynamically, if that goes down, of course, your web page just becomes a blank page and doesn't serve anything at all. So is there ever a time where you're going to recommend JavaScript frameworks to your clients then? I certainly would recommend it if you was building something such as Twitter, but then there's different ways to actually handle it so that search engines can see that. Um, information at the first and then to give the dynamic um, features later on to the user Uh, i don't think there's a case in e-commerce where you can really justify going fully ajax um, and not loading a static uh, html page to the user on the first visit so following on from that then so does an ajax website have any chance of ranking you know reasonably well in google It's definitely possible. I would say that if you're in a competitive industry, it gets a lot harder because not only do you have the off-page issues of making sure you've got better and more links than your competitors, you've also got the on-page issues of what if Google one day doesn't render my very important landing page and as a result I have no on-page ranking factors at all and therefore drop out of the uh, rankings for those. Uh, It takes a lot of resource internally to develop a solution that's perfect for SEO in terms of rendering the page and testing it and optimizing page speed. I'd say try and take Twitter's lead, though. They're going through um, a process which is called isomorphic rendering which is basically you load all of the HTML when the person first visits the page. And then if they have JavaScript enabled functionality, then they can click on things and it changes content dynamically. Whereas search engines, they create a new session, a new visit every time they go to a page. So they always get the static version. So that's kind of one approach which you can take. 
there's a lot to remember, isn't there, Rob? <laughs> there is. <laughs> so, okay, kind of, if we can summarise uh, what we've gone across today, what are your top tips for JavaScript framework e-commerce websites, please? Well, first of all, avoid it if you can. You know, <laughs> there's a reason why they don't have them built into the main e-commerce platforms from the beginning. You usually end up having to put a new front end or a new theme on your e-commerce platform in order to get this kind of functionality. You know, I don't think it's really appropriate for e-commerce sites at this time. Uh, if you are having to go down this approach, then make sure that you serve a fully rendered static HTML page, at least to search engines, but potentially to all visitors so that you can actually see the content on the page in the HTML without any JavaScript being needed. So have a look at the rendering solutions that are possible for that. And the third tip is to always cache when you are using pre-rendering and make sure that your servers are the ones which refresh the cache. Don't make it so that it requires a visitor to visit a page before a new copy of that page is rendered and then served. You know, you don't want your visitors to be the guinea pigs that create that cache. You want to have it so it's already there, instantly available and served just as quickly as a static HTML page can be loaded. Rob, I, I've got to say, it, you absolutely live and breathe this stuff, don't you? <laughs> unfortunately, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately for your clients, but maybe unfortunately for, you know, <laughs> the wife. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Rob, that's been absolutely brilliant. I think as a first show, uh, we've covered an awful lot in it in quite a short space of time. Um, don't forget, if you want to go and see all the show notes, you can see them at the website, ecommerce.fm, where we're going to be putting up all the shows uh, coming forward in the future. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that's us done and dusted for our very first show. How do you think it went, Rob? I think it went quite well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's certainly a lot of knowledge to be tapped into, uh, and uh, that's what we will continue to do across the weeks as we continue to put out more episodes of e-commerce FM. Thanks very much for listening, and we look forward to you joining us again next week. This is e-commerce FM, the e-commerce SEO podcast with Rob Carey and Matt Young. <laughs> <laughs>